Now again, look at verse 17 and 18. Jesus is going to respond to their charges. What have they charged him with? Well, they've said, Jesus, you've broken the Sabbath. Okay, that's our first charge. And then we also read that they charge him with blasphemy as well, right? Blasphemy. So they charge Jesus with two things. Jesus, you've broken the Sabbath. And Jesus, you have committed blasphemy. Now let's talk real quickly about this first accusation. Jesus, you've broken the Sabbath. Write this verse down if you would or just log it in the old noodle up there. Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. You know it probably. It says that God had created the heavens and the earth and then he rested or he ceased on the seventh day. That's the best translation. It's not that God was tuckered out and he just didn't have no strength left and so he had to take a day off. No, he ceased. How do you know God doesn't get tired? Hello? God does not get tired. He's got a big world to take care of. I'm glad he doesn't get tired. <laughs> I'm glad I don't have to, when I'm in need, wonder if God's taking a nap. Or he's sick and, 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 or is too busy. To t- no, he doesn't get tired. He ceased. He's creating and then he stops his work of creation. So what happens is the rabbis, philosophers of the day began to debate with one another and say, okay, what does it really mean when it says that God rested or that he ceased on this Sabbath? Well, uh, J. Ramsey Michaels gives a nice little summary here and it's concise and that's why I want to share it with you. He notes this, their conclusion, talk about the rabbis of Jesus' day and the philosophers they, their conclusion was that God did not actually stop working after six days. For if he had, the world would have ceased to exist. Instead, he simply ended his work of creation and began his work of sustaining and watching over the world. That makes sense. Would you agree? God is still working. He's working in this world. I know he's working in this heart. <laughs> he's working in your heart and life too, isn't he? So yeah, God's working, and guess what? Does He do a work in your life on the Sabbath day? Yeah, it's not like God only works six days, and then on the seventh day He doesn't do any work in your life or in this world. So again, you hear where they're coming from, okay? And uh, so we find what happens is the rabbis did say, okay, God does in fact work on the Sabbath, but man is not like God. So man should not work on the Sabbath. This is what should distinguish God and man. Everybody following their thoughts so far? Now notice what happens here. What's the real point that's trying to be made here in our text, okay, in John chapter 5? Well, since Jesus is in fact the unique Son of God, which we've seen the Gospel of John lay that out. Jesus is that beloved, unique Son of God. He is God's official representative on this earth. We talked about that last week, right? So again, because Jesus is the unique Son of God, because He's God's representative, therefore, if God can continue to work positively in His creation on the Sabbath and not take a day off or totally rest, it only stands the reason that Jesus is not wrong for doing works of grace and mercy on the Sabbath day. Did everybody follow that? Okay. So again, Jesus is using great wisdom here. Okay, And He's saying, listen... Because I'm who I am, that gives me the divine right to be doing good on the Sabbath. Remember, over in the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus will in fact say, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Because the main emphasis was on not doing bad or evil on the Sabbath. Jesus said, well, that's all right. Yeah, sure, don't do evil on any day. But don't forget, it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Even though it's lawful for us to do good on the Sabbath. Hello? And so again, this is where Jesus is coming from. Now let's wrap things up just briefly talking about this second accusation. Again, Jesus has been accused of committing blasphemy. What causes the red flag to go up? Jesus has not only done something that they felt like only God should be able to do on the Sabbath, but now Jesus is using God language, we would say. Jesus doesn't refer to God as our Father. How does he refer to God? My father. This was taboo in ancient Judaism. Nobody talked about God being their personal own. My father. Even Jesus. Remember when he told his disciples how to pray? How does the disciple or or, uh, Lord's prayer begin? Our 
Father who's in the heavens, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us, not me, give us. Everybody say us. Give us today today's bread. Forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into times of tribulation past what we're able to stand, but deliver us from the evil one. So when Jesus uses this kind of terminology, my father, red flag, because they held that Jesus was claiming to have some unique relationship with God that they didn't have. And of course, we know as the Messiah, as the Son of God, He does in fact have a relationship with the Father that you and I don't have. Hello? Hello? So Jesus can use this language, but He's going to have to take the rest of this chapter trying to help them understand why He can talk like this. And we'll see that it's not just the rest of this chapter. It's the rest of the Gospel of John that's going to highlight Jesus' unique role as the Son of God. Right? And so again, it's a great, great passage. But here, because he talked like this, they said that he was making himself equal, putting himself on equal footing as God. And this is what they had a really, really big problem with. John chapter 5, verse 19 is where we're going to start. So Shell, take us away. All right, before we read our text, I uh, just want to recap just a tad that last week we talked about Jesus healing a man at the pool of Bethesda, and it was a Sabbath day. And so this was a great controversy that the man that had formerly been paralyzed was carrying his mat on the Sabbath. So this week we will carry on in the context as Daniel said at verse 19. Let's read it. It says, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the son of, uh, can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever he does, that the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Though we have seven sermons in John chapters 2 through 11, uh, seven sermons or discourses, this is the only discourse where Jesus is uninterrupted, meaning instead of having a two-way conversation like with Nicodemus or the woman at the well where it's him and them talking back and forth, he's the only one speaking here. So it's a monologue instead of a dialogue. He's uninterrupted. He utters some very profound statements here, doesn't he? And he makes some bold assertions about himself. It's as if he's on a trial of sort, and he's giving his defense. And we'll see later he's got witnesses. And you can see that verse 19, truly, truly, I say to you, the uh, son can do nothing of his own accord. We see how that relates back to our text last week, verse 17, where Jesus answered those that were criticizing him by saying my father is working still and I am working so he ties it in by saying truly truly or your translation may say verily verily in the Greek it's amen amen and we've mentioned this before uh, that there are 25 times in the gospel of John where Jesus will emphasize something with that double amen 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 or truly truly uh, and three of them occur here 
Uh, and so it's very important. Of course, everything Jesus says is important. But when we see this phrase, it really highlights the fact that we should pay careful attention to his words, that what he is saying is of utmost importance to our ears. He's only doing what the Father has told him to do. He's not doing anything of himself, he says. He's not, as he's being accused of, he's not in opposition to the Father. No, he is carrying out the Father's wishes. He's doing exactly what the Father told him to do. We remember Moses would even say in Numbers chapter 16, verse 28, it says, and Moses said, by this, he's talking to the people, you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works. Remember the signs and wonders that Moses did. He sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own will, Moses will say. And, of course, Jesus is the fulfillment of that prophet like Moses that was prophesied. And so we see here that the father led Jesus to the invalid at the pool, and Jesus healed him in an instant. And I like what D.A. Carson says. He says, it is impossible for the son to take independent, self-determined action that would set him over against the father as another god. So, no, that's not what he's doing. He is acting on his father's behalf. The father's love, D.A. Carson will continue, the father's love for the son expresses itself in his free disclosure. And the son's love for the father does so in his obedient submission to the father's will, including death on the cross including death on the cross. He is submissive to the Father's will. So Jesus isn't hostile to God the Father, as he's accused of here. Uh, he's not in rebellion uh, to the Father by healing on the Sabbath. No, he is carrying out the Father's wishes and says he is dependent upon the Father. Uh, verse 20, it start, Jesus starts off by saying, for the father loves the son. And then he gives this little proverb about an apprentice learning from his master teacher. And at the time of Jesus, sons usually learned their life's work, their life's trade from their father. At the time of Jesus, the father would pass on the trade to the son and the son would carry on the work of the father. And so we know that jo Joseph trained Jesus to be a carpenter. And so here Jesus is alluding to that very earthly imagery of a father training the son. And so Jesus brings it a step higher to talk about his heavenly father. He's carrying on his work. Did you notice, I tried to emphasize all the four statements. There's four of them here. Four, four statements. <laughs> in Greek, it's the word gar. Uh, and it's, they're all right together in his passage. And as we said, he's like, it's on, he's, he's on a trial and he's making making his case. He is making his defense with these proofs for this proof, for that proof, for, for, and he is making his defense. Jesus says we'll see greater works, meaning greater things than healing an invalid. We'll see works of salvation, and Jesus will also speak of raising the dead and executing judgment. Raising the dead, executing judgment. When we look at the Hebrew scriptures and also the literature from the second temple period, uh, we notice that raising the dead or giving life and executing judgment are things that only God can do. Only God can do. And as the author uh, by the name of Kostenberger says, he points out that that literature concurs that raising the dead and giving life are the sole prerogatives of God, meaning nobody else can do those things but God alone. And m most of Jesus' contemporaries didn't believe that the Messiah had the authority to actually raise the dead. Remember, not all believed that the Messiah would be God, would he, would, that he would be divine, or that there would only be one Messiah. Remember, we've talked about the varying vast amount of opinions uh, at the time of Jesus. But so Jesus makes it clear here that as the Messiah, he will give life and he will execute judgment on the Father's behalf. Uh, and so then we see in verse 21, there's that four statement again, another proof. Jesus speaks of raising the dead. Again, according to the Hebrew scriptures, only God can give life. Remember, it's God himself who breathed the very breath of life into Adam. And every day, he allows life to come into this world and also depart from it every day, every minute of every day, we could even say. He can raise the dead as well, both here and now, like he's going to do very soon with Lazarus. He can raise the dead here and now. And of course, in the prophesied resurrection, 
as well. Uh, so the father, just as he gives life, so too, Jesus says, the son gives life. In verse 22, Jesus speaks of judgment. Again, two of the prerogatives of God are giving life and executing judgment. And as we see that the father uh, has assigned all of the judgment to the son, uh, he says, the son is going to, to be the judge, and that's because the father has given this authority to him. Uh, let's reread verse 23. It says that all may honor the son even as they honor the father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. We know that sometimes God would give great honor to those who would represent him. We see that throughout the Bible, King David, King Solomon. He gave great honor to those people, but no one other than Jesus, was ever given the same honor as God himself. Only Jesus, because, of course, he is God. The, only, the one who does not honor the Son is, in effect, not honoring the Father, too. God's word and Jesus' word are one and the same. And Jesus makes it clear if we want to be right with God, there is no other way to come to the Father except by Jesus. No other way. He makes it that simple for us. Uh, verse 24 speaks of eternal life. And as we've stressed so many times before, the Gospel of John emphasizes that eternal life is not just for a future gift. It's not just for the future, but present reality for those who believe on Jesus. We will have abundant life. And, but it does seem like many, if not most of the people uh, of Jesus' day, were influenced by uh, passages like Daniel 12, 2, where it talks about the resurrection of the righteous. And maybe they thought of eternal life as a gift to the righteous after the resurrection. Uh, but here we see that when our faith is put in Jesus, we cross over from the death side to the life side, in the here and now. And of course, we're going to enjoy eternal life throughout all time and eternity in the world to come. But right now, eternal life, abundant life begins. Let's reread verse 25. It says, truly, truly, I say to you, the hour is coming. Remember, that theme of the hour is very important in the Gospel of John. Very important. The hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live. This voice makes us think of so many passages. But one passage we think of is Ezekiel 37, when God instructed the prophet Ezekiel to prophesy to the valley of dry bones. And those dead bones came to life in his vision. That voice that can speak to dead things and life can come from it. Uh, the voice also uh, brings to mind 1 Thessalonians 4.16, that beloved passage where the voice of the archangel will cry out when the dead in Christ are raised. And specifically in John, we know that Lazarus responds to Jesus' voice after being dead for four days. And what does Jesus say? Lazarus, come forth. And he responded to that voice. So we see that the dead will hear that voice, and it speaks of resurrection. Jesus uses that phrase, son of God, here. He specific For those who say Jesus never claimed to be the son of God, well, there's a lot of places where he claimed to be the son of God. And this is one of them. And several more times in John, he will use that specific phrase the son of God, and he's referring to himself. Um, and then in verse 26, for as the father has life in himself, so he's granted the son to also have life in himself. There's that other for statement, that other proof that Jesus is who he says he is. What he says here is similar to verse 21 when he says, for as the father raises the dead and gives life, so also the son gives life to whom he will. Here he says, for as the father has life in himself, so he has granted the son also to have life in himself. Do you see that? The father has this, for the father has this, so the son has this. And so in Jewish thought, God was the only one with life in and of himself. All other life comes from God. God's the only one with life in and of himself. Verse 27 repeats that the son has the authority to execute judgment. And remember who he's talking to. Jesus' audience and their concept of the Messiah. Jesus will call himself the Son of Man here. Not only does he call himself Son of God in verse 25, he calls himself Son of Man 
in verse 27. And we see that phrase a lot in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it is one of the most, we've talked about it before, one of the most divine titles ascribed to Jesus because it's rooted in Daniel chapter 7. Uh, in fact, in the Greek of this text, it's used here without the article the, without the word the. So it says because he is son of man. It doesn't say because he is the son of man. It says because he is son of man. And this is the only time that this phrase occurs without the the in front of it. And that should be interesting to us because if we go back uh, to the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures in Daniel chapter 7 verse 13, it also occurs without the article the. When Daniel tells of his night vision, remember, and he sees this heavenly throne room, he says, and with the clouds of the sky, one like a son of man was approaching. He went up to the ancient of days and was escorted before him. He's talking about Jesus here. And everyone in Jesus' day knew that he was using this terminology from Daniel. The son of man is going to rule the kingdom of God. And so Jesus applying that to himself is very audacious. And he wants people to ponder and think about that. Verses 28 through 29 speak of hearing that voice again. He reiterates that, and of the resurrection. The Hebrews uh, scripture stated that in the last day, there would be a resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous. I mentioned that verse before, Daniel 12, 2. And we remember that when Jesus died on the cross, people were even raised to life as a first fruits of the resurrection. Read Matthew 27 later. When Jesus died, People were raised out of the graves and walked around Jerusalem. That's amazing. And that showed as the first fruits of that future resurrection. And of course, on the third day, Jesus himself was raised. Again, foreshadowing the hope of all believers. The hope of all believers is that resurrection. So in this context, the point that Jesus is trying to make is if Jesus has authority over eternal life, he certainly has power over the Sabbath. Uh, if he's got the authority to judge, he certainly has authority over the Sabbath. And we've talked about this. It's rabbinic language, this uh, Hebrew term, kal vehomer, kal vehomer, the lesser to the greater, the light versus the heavy. How much more? When Jesus says how much more, it was a common rabbinical phrase that the rabbis used to illustrate a point from the lesser to the greater. He's saying, look, if I have the authority to raise the dead and be the judge, don't I also have the authority to heal on the Sabbath? Even on the Sabbath, God gives life as people are born every single day. And he executes judgment because people die every day too, even on the Sabbath. And if the Father does these things even on the Sabbath, he has also given Jesus the authority to do these things. Remember in Matthew 10 and Mark 9, Jesus says something very similar to what he'll say here, where he says, whoever receives me, receives the one who sent me. Whoever receives me, receives the one who sent me. Uh, in verses 28 and 29, I just want to read it real quick again. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. We've got a couple of statements where Jesus says that you may marvel. They're in the last part of verse 20. And here he says, do not marvel. So he shows us the right way and the wrong way to marvel, uh, so to speak. Do not be amazed at what he has said, that in this life, Jesus the Son, in his capacity as Son of Man, Son of God, he raises the dead also, and he executes judgment also. We see him dividing those in this verse, those who have eternal life and those who are condemned based on what people have done based on what they've done, their actions. That is, their actions of how they have responded to Jesus. Did they accept him or not? And whether they have the eternal life or eternal judgment will depend on what have they done with Jesus. Much like Jesus separates the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the tares. That's that same imagery that he has here as well. Life and death are directly tied to our response to Jesus. 
Life and death are directly tied to our response to Jesus. I love what Francis Maloney says. He has a wonderful thought, and he says, The criteria for one's post-tomb experience of resurrection will be their pre-tomb lives. The criteria for one's post-tomb experience of resurrection will be their pre-tomb lives lives. So what we do in this life with Jesus obviously does matter in the world to come. Life and death are directly tied to what we do with Jesus. So Dan, continue on as Jesus continues his defense here in this chapter. So let's look at it. Verse number 30, Jesus again says, I can do nothing on my own authority. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Verse 31, if I bear witness, here it comes, if I bear witness to myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness to me, and I know that the testimony which he bears is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony which I receive is from man, but I say this that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony which I have is greater than that of John. For the works which the Father has granted me to accomplish, these very works which I am doing bear witness that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness to me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you. For you do not believe him whom he has sent. You search or diligently examine or study the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness to me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from men, but I know that you have not the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you'll receive. How can you believe who receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. It is who? Yeah, it's Moses who accuses you on whom you have set your hope. And then notice this. If you believed Moses, you would believe who? Me. For he wrote of me, but you do not believe his writings. So how will you believe my word? 